true honor it is to introduce Dr. Grandin and a, uh, a very large thank you goes out to the Shea Center for hosting this event and the CSU Alumni um, Society for, um, for having me uh, provide this introduction and being part of this. My name is Adam Dario and I am the director of the Temple Grandin Equine Center. So this evening during my introduction, I'm gonna make some really big and pretty bold and impressive statements about Dr. Grandin. And once you meet her and once you hear her speak, then you're going to know that I'm not bragging that uh, everything I say is, is very well deserved. So my personal tie to Dr. Grandin is that I am a former student of hers and now a fellow faculty member. I have been recently hired by Colorado State University to build and manage the Temple Grandin Equine Center. And much like the Shea Center, the Temple Grandin Equine Center will be an exclusive facility focusing on integrating research and education in equine assisted activities and therapies. We believe that this collaborative effort at CSU through the Colleges of Agricultural Sciences, Health and Human Sciences, and Veterinary Medicine will include research studies for individuals with autism, military veterans with post-traumatic stress, elders with dementia, and many, many other disabilities and challenges. And we will truly, <clears throat> excuse me, will truly be an honor and a tribute to the namesake, Dr. Grandin. As a child, Dr. Grandin exhibited the signs of severe autism, and specifically, she did not have speech. But as she grew older, she was constantly bullied and teased. But what's amazing is that you'll hear Dr. Grandin say that she found her salvation in being around and working with horses. Her best friend was Lady, a horse, and her prized possession, her English saddle. Dr. Grandin's experiences around horses and her time spent on her aunt's ranch motivated her to study and pursue a career as a scientist in the livestock industry. She has a bachelor's from Franklin Pierce College in 1970. She received her master's in animal science from Arizona State University in 1975 and her PhD in animal science from the University of Illinois in 1989. Currently, Dr. Grannon is the world-renowned animal science professor at Colorado State University. Dr. Grannon is a leading equipment designer livestock handling consultant and animal welfare advocate. In fact, more than half of all the cattle in the United States and in Canada are handled in equipment that has been designed by Dr. Grandin. As a researcher and an author, yes, that's, yes. As a researcher and an author, Dr. Grandin has published several hundred industry publications 63 refereed journal articles, and more than 10 books, including Animals in Translation, which is a New York Times best-selling book. So Dr. Grandin is a New York Times best-selling author. Dr. Grandin's inspiring life was the feature of an HBO movie, which received seven Emmy Awards, a Golden Globe, and a Peabody. Other accolades that deserve mentioning. Dr. Grandin has been a board member for the Autism Society of America, She's received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. She's an inducted member of the Cowgirl Hall of Fame. And she has been named as one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time Magazine. Yes. So without further ado, I give you Dr. Grandin. don't all blow away because I do need to have a few notes and when I was in high school I got bullied and teased and the only place I was not bullied and teased was when I was out riding. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of getting kids involved in shared interest things. You know riding was just great. And this brings up another really important, I'm take this part off, that's driving me crazy. Um, another thing that it's really important is students get interested in the things they get exposed to. You know, last year I gave a talk at one of, at one of the big universities and I had a whole bunch of students ask me, well, how did you get interested in cattle? I was exposed to them as a teenager. And just the other day I was at Fermi Lab. That was really interesting. Let me tell you, it's Asperger's busting out all over. <laughs> yes, I did a little office inspection, lots of messy offices there too. You know, one geek gets to go to a place like Fermilab, 
and they're the same geek. When I worked in construction all the time in my cattle facilities, they were people in skilled trades that I know were on the spectrum. You know, sometimes with some of the kids that are fully verbal, we're letting the, the labels kind of holding them back. Mother had a really good sense of how much to stretch me, how much to push me. Uh, you know, you don't throw the kid in the, in the deep end of the pool, but you've got to not coddle them. But getting out there and getting exposed to cattle was a really great thing. I had a graduate student, her name's Lily Calloway Edwards, and she now works as a, for the JBS uh, company. And she had no background in cattle at all. But she got out to Colorado State and she got exposed to them. We got to get kids out doing things. I mean, today kids are not doing enough hands-on things. And hands-on things teach practical problem solving. I spent hours when I was in like second grade making these bird kites to fly behind my trike. And I'd stiffen the wings with adhesive tape and I had to get them just right so that they would fly. I had to learn how to make mistakes. A lot of kids today freak out when they make a mistake. Well, I found out that a sail on my red wagon really wasn't such a good idea, and I'm glad that didn't work because it might have been dangerous because it was a pretty big sail I made. <laughs> One of my big concerns I'm seeing today is I'm, I'm seeing too many smart kids kind of just getting shunted aside. I think taking out hands-on classes out of the schools is the worst thing they did. If I hadn't had sewing and artwork when I was a little kid, I would have just gone absolutely nowhere. Those are the things that kept me going. There are also things that you can turn into careers. Now one of the things I really like to talk about is different ways of thinking. I am a visual thinker. I think in pictures. This has helped me with my work with animals because animals don't think in words. They are sensory based thinkers. You've got to get away from words. What is it seeing? What is it hearing? On the plane today I was reading in the New York Times science section about all the different bird calls in the forests. And different birds have different calls for predators. And other animals know those calls, like birds will know the squirrel call for something that's dangerous. It's a, a world of sensory detail, tone of voice. I mean, if you walked up to your dog and went, good dog, good dog, and you screamed at him like that, I don't think your dog's gonna be very happy because they respond to the tone of voice. It is a sensory-based world it's not a word-based world. And I want to mention a few things about animal fear memories. Animals will often get afraid of something that they were looking at or hearing right at the absolute exact moment that something bad happened. Like a dog might get afraid of a place where he got hit by a car. In my book, Animals in Translation, I uh, talk about a horse that uh, got terrified of black hats because during a veterinary procedure, a guy with a black cowboy hat threw alcohol in his eyes. White hats were fine, black hats were bad. You see, it's specific. There's an interesting experiment that was done in Germany by Lerner and Find, and they found that if you train the horse to tolerate a blue and white umbrella suddenly opening, that doesn't um, mean that he's gonna be calm if you throw a great big orange canvas in his face. See, think about it, an umbrella and a canvas look completely different. See, when it's sensory based, it's much more specific. Now, I was reading another interesting paper in the Journal of Animal Science that cattle, now they, you see, they have some ability to generalize because uh, cattle that um, have no experience with wolves don't get particularly worried about, um, about the smell of wolves and barking German shepherds, where cows that have had experience with wolves get in a big stress response. Yes, and it does generalize to other dogs. You see, they have a limited ability to generalize. But it's sensory based, not word based. Now, it was easy for me to figure that out because I thought in pictures. And when I was young, I thought everybody thought in pictures. I didn't realize that other people um, think differently. And learning how my mind was different has been interesting. I'm a visual thinker, had a horrible time with algebra. I'm worried, really worried now about all this algebra craziness screening out the visual thinkers. Well, we need them. Okay, the physicists were trying to explain to me the stuff they did at Fermilab, I didn't understand it. But I did understand that the magnets that they invented are in every MRI machine. That I did understand. Then I got down to the drafting department, so my, that's my department, and the machine shop, I understand that stuff. And the physicists aren't gonna have any of their equipment if they don't have the people more like me that actually build the stuff. You see, this is where you have to have the different kinds of minds. 
The mathematician thinks in patterns. Visual thinker thinks in pictures. And I'm worried that a lot of really talented kids are getting screened out with the Albert algebra craziness. So how did I manage to get through school? Because in 67, finite math was the national required class in 67, which is probability, matrices, and statistics. So what do you do if your kids flunk in algebra? Well, why don't you go to geometry and trig? That's the first thing I would do. Maybe they'll let you get out of it somehow. But there actually are kids that are studying physics in college, doing really well and they can't graduate from high school. I'm not suggesting getting out of math, but we're seeing too many smart kids kind of getting consigned to the basement to play video games instead of getting out and designing stuff. Okay, I asked the people at Fermilab, how did you get into your careers? I had a very nice meeting with about 10 women that worked there. They were mechanical engineers and they were physicists. About half of them, it was a high school teacher that turned them on. I had a great science teacher, Mr. Carlot. He helped turn me on. This is where a good teacher makes such a difference. And then I went down to the drafting department, and that was a two-year community college degree. You know, that got them into that. And then they had to take a bunch of other programming after they got there. But they started out with a two-year community college degree. That's who builds the stuff. So you have to have the different minds. And then you have the people that are the word thinkers. We've got to be working on building on the kids' strength. I'm really pleased here at the Writing Center that you work really hard on progressing them to independent writing. I think that is really a good thing. I've noticed you know, this is a much more sophisticated program than what um, many other places do. But you're working on getting them to progress. I think what we'll do now is I think I want to just open it up for questions, because that's the part I like the best, because I wasn't able to have any slides tonight. So I'm going to pick somebody, if somebody doesn't get their hands up really, really quickly. <laughs> so somebody better get their hands up. What is Fermi Lab? Fermi Lab? It's the accelerator lab, you know, Atom Smasher. They now have one in CERN that's even bigger. It found the Higgs boson. And some of the stuff they were talking about I didn't understand very well. I so said, wait a minute, now, you've got to get me back to elementary chemistry. Well, it, we went down in this freight elevator, down into a pit in the ground, about 300 feet below the ground, where they're shooting neutrinos up to Minnesota. So getting back to elementary chemistry, I'm standing on this metal catwalk in this, in this tunnel with a whole bunch of computer bank stuff on one side of it. And I go, think about elementary chemistry. I'm holding this metal handrail, but it's not really solid. So when you go back to elementary chemistry, remember the nucleus and then the electrons orbit around it? Well, you've got a lot of space in between the electrons and the nucleus. Well, the, neutron, the neutrinos just go right through that. What could you do with that in the future? Well, maybe it would be the transporter on Star Trek. Who knows? Next time you download, download a movie from Netflix, think about Fermilab. They developed some of the data compression technology that makes that possible. Because while it was there, we've got to tell the public why the taxpayer ought to be you know, spending money on something like these kinds of projects. Well, there'd be no MRI machine if it wasn't for the magnets that were invented at Fermilab. I just, I just sort of got them, you know, we were up in the, this beautiful office building, and I said, wait a minute, you're going to have to tell me some stuff, plain English, that the public can understand. The data compression and the magnets are things that can be understood. I went out to the Jet Propulsion Lab. See, these are, this is my other world. These are the geek paradises. I've been to Google, Fermilab, JPL, and going to NASA this summer. Well, it's all Asperger's. Man, you go around that place, and it's spot to Aspie. And I saw lots and lots and lots of them. You see, the thing about the autism spectrum is a little bit of the trait can give you some advantages. Yeah, take out some social circuits, get some geek circuits. Too much of the trait, and you've got some very severe problems. And autism spectrum diagnosis has gotten so broad right now that from a service provider standpoint, it doesn't really make too much sense. But I'm seeing, I'm seeing too many smart kids that ought to be going into a skilled trade. We have a huge shortage of mechanics, machinists, and, and uh, uh, people to do a certified welding. Huge shortage. Maybe become a physicist. Maybe become a computer programmer over at Google. 
and another one's playing video games in the basement. They're the same geek. You see, I don't think in words. I think in pictures. So it's what they look like, what do they sound like, and what do their offices look like? I checked that out. And they were asking me, why are you looking in everybody's office? Because I was doing spot to Aspie. And then I, then I, gave, um, I gave two talks there. And there were quite a few parents there of autistic children. I said, look up at that big tower. It's full of them. A lot of them are gray now. And I love the guy who started Fermi Lab. He hated bureaucracy, just hated it. But he did really cool stuff. All right, that's a good question. When I realize I have somebody in my class that's not a visual thinker, how do I work with them? The first step is knowing there's different kinds of minds. You know, you've always heard of the different kinds of fights. The artists hate the accountants. The, the techies hate the suits. You know, they, the field staff think the academics are all stupid. You know, there's all these sort of things like this. It's the different kinds of minds. The first step is to recognize they think differently. And the different kinds of minds can complement each other because the word thinker is very good at linear thought and planning things. I'm an associative thinker. I'm not that good at organizing. That's one of the reasons why I've used co-authors in a lot of my books, because I've got to have organization. And, and uh, see, that's different kinds of minds working together and just understanding that they're different. Take the iPhone. An artist made the interface. Engineers made the inside work. So the mathematicians made it work, but the artist made it easy to use. You see, that's the two kinds of minds working together. And I discuss this in detail in my book, The Autistic Brain, which unfortunately didn't get shipped here tonight. Uh, you can buy it online, The Autistic Brain. And in that, I have scientific evidence for the different kinds of minds. There are brain scan studies, yes, done with magnets from Fermilab, that show that different kinds of minds actually really do exist with evidence base, because we're really big on that today. So you see how everything is associated together. And I want to see kids get out and be successful. I'm seeing too many fully verbal kids today that do not know how to shake hands. I've taught them how to shake hands. Uh, they don't know how to shop. I was shopping by the time I was eight years old. You know, that we've got to get them out doing things because when you're a visual thinker, you're a bottom-up thinker. So you've got to get them out doing things because you've got to fill up their brain with web pages. Somebody asked me, how's your thinking gotten as you've gotten older? It's gotten better because I've got more and more web pages in my mind that I can search. <laughs> well, the cattle stuff, you know, things evolve. When I, let, let's just go through how things evolve. When I was a real little kid, I wanted to be a scientist and I loved inventors. My grandfather is the co-inventor of the automatic pilot for airplanes. And so we'd go over to Granny's and Grandpa's house for, uh, for um, it was Grandfather. He didn't like being called Grandpa. But while all the other adults in the living room, Grandfather would be sitting in the study reading Scientific American, smoking his pipe, and I'd ask him things like, why is grass green? And he would explain it to me. And I found that very, very interesting. I had a book about famous inventors. So I was always interested in those sorts of things. Then when I got to, I had a bad time in high school with bullying and teasing. I was kicked out of school for fighting and throwing a book at a girl, beating her on the head with a real heavy book. I went to boarding school for troubled kids that were smart. And the first two years at my boarding school, I cleaned horse stalls. And I basically ran a horse barn. My mother was not too thrilled about that, but... I think Mr. Patey realized I was learning job skills. This is another problem we have today. A lot of these kids aren't learning any work skills. When I was 13, his mother was always stretching me. She got me a sewing job. Then when I was 15, I went out to my aunt's ranch. So I was getting lots of experience. I got exposed to beef cattle and a squeeze chute out at my aunt's ranch. You see, this gets back to getting exposed to interesting things. Just like the Fermi Lab scientists that got exposed to physics in high school. That's one of the reasons why they went there rather than somewhere else. You've got to get them out doing things. And I'm getting really concerned about the video game addictions because they're not having good outcomes. Now, there's a few successes. Um, so there are a few that go into the video game industry. But then someone's got to expose them to programming. They're not going to learn it by osmosis. Somebody's going to say, here on Khan Academy is a program for learning C++ and JavaScript. Let's get going and learn it. 
You see, again, you've got to expose them. And how did I get exposed to beef cattle? Because when I was 14, my mother got remarried. If that had not happened, the ranch wouldn't have come into the family. You see, sometimes there's just luck. I was an Easterner. You know, in the movie, beautifully showed all the doors. Being a visual thinker, everything was about doors. And I'm finding most people don't see the doors. And I think some of the problem now is a lot of young people today haven't done any hands-on things. It's kind of a lack of resourcefulness. I can't believe some of the emails I get. Things like, what is this drug? They didn't ask me an opinion about it. What is it? I had to look it up on Google. I mean, really, you should have looked that up on Google first. What's the increase? Why it's increasing? I think so on the high end, on the fully verbal end, a lot of it's increased detection. Because today in the school system, to get any kind of special ed, you've got to have a label. And, and uh, that's part of it. Um, I think some uh, intellectual impairment gets an autism label be so they can get services that may not explain all of it. I think there might be some true increase, but I'm going to guess about half the increase is increased uh, detection. Because when I go to places like the construction site at the meatpacking plant, and I go to Fermi Lab, it's spot the ass peep. There's a whole shop full of hippies in the maintenance shop of one of the big plants. The plant will fall down without them. And they've got enough social skills to survive three plant owners. <laughs> Stay away from the suits and make sure the plant doesn't break. It's that simple. That's what they do. I've had lunch at their picnic table out in their shop. You see, this is what makes me kind of crazy because I'm seeing, uh, I know people in metal fabrication that are definitely on the spectrum, all undiagnosed. People maybe 10 years younger than me. No, I'm seeing too many of these smart kids, the fully verbal ones, becoming their label. No. For me, horses came first. Horses first when I was in my teens. The cattle come first. Autism is an important part of who I am, but my career comes first. And I've made a point of going to places like Fermi Lab because I'm seeing too many youngsters that could maybe get a job in a cool place like that, and that's not where they're going. Also, I want to encourage these cool places to reach out to the autism community. I want to break through, uh, out of the silos because some of the techies, they want to avoid the labels. I had an employee of Fermi Lab come up to me after she heard my talk there and said, so a person with gray hair, she says, I'm pretty sure I'm on the spectrum. Yep, and they never held you back. You got a great job and think of all the fun things you got to design. And everything at Fermi Labs for peaceful use. They're not making atom bombs there. It's all peaceful stuff. Okay, the question is, how did I figure out I thought in pictures? I knew I was a visual thinker, but the epiphany came, and I wrote about this in my book, Thinking in Pictures. Um, and unfortunately, I have to pick up books online now. They ran out of them. But thinking in pictures, I was at an autism meeting, and I asked a speech therapist. Again, this is a verbal person. I hadn't really thought. Think about a church steeple. How does it come into your mind? And she goes, pointy thing like this. And I go, whoa. I see specific ones, and I can name them off. You know, somebody that tends to be more visual will start naming the steeples off. Now, I've deliberately didn't ask house or car, because most people will see their own home and see their own car. But when I ask them something they don't really care about, like church steeples, but everybody has to see them, then they get a much more vague kind of image. And I go, whoa, there are different kinds of minds. And then I got to be figuring out about the pattern thinker. I started interviewing people. Then, when I did the autistic brain, now that's about three years ago now, I did that book with Richard Panic. I was surfing the internet one night, 3 o'clock in the morning when I couldn't sleep, and I found brain scan studies that verified the visual thinker like me and the math pattern thinker. I go, wow, this is really, really good. There are different kinds of minds. Now, most people are kind of more even mixtures of the different kinds of minds, but the people that get a label are, tend to be more good at one thing, terrible at something else. A lot of the mathematician kids, they have a horrible time with reading. It tends to be the pattern. Oh, I have full color, vivid dreams. Full color dreams. And I, I have a little balance problem, so I'm always finding myself up on high places, like driving down a hill that's like that. Something really, or some roof that I wish I wasn't up on. 
a lot of high places. Um, yeah, it's all in full color. Uh, it's mostly visual. They'll, they'll have some sound, but sound's not a major part of it. Uh, diet. Um, there are some kids where uh, wheat-free, dairy-free are helpful. I find with me, I have to have a lot of animal protein. There is no way I could be a vegan. I got to support the animal industry in the morning. But exercise, a lot of these kids are not getting enough exercise. That helps. Also, when I got into puberty, I had horrible anxiety attacks. And taking antidepressant medication helped me on that. And my personal experiences with that are also in my book, uh, Thinking in Pictures. Unfortunately, I'll have to buy it online. I won't be able to sign it. Autism okay. spectrum, okay. Well, at one end of the spectrum, you have half of NASA, half of Google. You have the people like Van Gogh and Mozart. Uh, Einstein, who had no language till age three. That's at one end of the spectrum. And then you go way to the other end of the spectrum. You have somebody that never learns how to talk and maybe has epilepsy and motor coordination problems. So that you're going from a very, very big spectrum. And then you have the ones that are moderate, where they're partially verbal. You know, the main core criteria in autism is, um, is the social problems with social relatedness. Some of the social circuits aren't hooked up, eye contact, face recognition being a problem. But what's happened now with the DSM, the latest DSM in 2013, is it's made the spectrum so broad that from a service provider standpoint, it's a total mess. Now, if a child's three and he's not talking, I don't care what his diagnosis is, it's 20 hours a week of early intervention. You got to work on these kids. You cannot let just let them sit in the corner vegetating. You got to work on them. I'm going to just call them a lot of weird behavior and not talking at age three. You better do something. You better do something about it now. Don't wait. Well, I still have some problems with things against my skin. I do have a T-shirt under it, and um, there's some uh, T-shirts where they're very scratchy. I still have some problems with scratchy clothes. I used to love Old Navy pants, and then they went to another cheaper Chinese supplier or something, and, and they itch now. I hate them now. <laughs> and if they, um, if they were to go back to the old softens, I'd start buying them again. But I just can't stand them now. So I still have some problems with that. But some of this gets desensitized by just getting out doing things. Let me give you some, hit, some tips on desensitizing sound sensitivity. Let the child initiate the dreaded sound. Or maybe he can't stand being in Walmart for too long. OK, we're going to go in Walmart. When he's had enough, he'll give you a signal like that. You take him out. In other words, let him control it. You know, if he, you, you absolutely cannot wear headphones all the time. If you wear headphones all the time, you've got to make it more sensitive. You've got to, you, need, you need to control it. Um, deep pressure can help desensitize you know, the kids that don't want to be held. See, so the squeezing machine helped desensitize that. You know, deep pressure can desensitize some of those things. There's also a paper you can pick up online called Environmental Enrichment is an Effective Treatment for Autism. Now, I want to make it very clear that it doesn't replace ABA or some other therapy, but it's uh, adjunct. Three key words, environmental enrichment autism. You've got to use those key words, otherwise you won't find it on Google. And it's a sensory stimulation method where you stimulate two senses at once. Okay, like when, when you're uh, riding, okay, that's the vestibular sense you're stimulating, and then the kid's got to, like, grab a ring that's vision. You see, it's two senses at once. And you always have one of the primitive senses being one of the senses, either smell, um, touch or balance. And you're always changing the stimuli. Now they're just using household things. But I noticed you had an OT room here and you had a child this afternoon swinging in an in inner tube. Well, you might do that and have him smell aroma, different aromatherapies. Or maybe one time he's going to hold some smooth thing in his hand. Another time he's going to hold a sandpaper in his hand. So you're, you're always changing the stimuli. That's one of the keys to it. You're always stimulating two senses, and you're always changing the stimuli. And when they had psychologists blind to treatment, evaluated blind to treatment, this is a properly done study, they had some improvements. And, and I think you could get that paper and take some of those ideas. Just remember, three principles. Two senses at the same time. OK, horses are really big on the balance and the vestibular system. But then maybe you might play a little music Another time, make different visual things they got to do. Maybe they're going to hold something else in, in their hand. 
and you always stimulate two senses together, always changing it, always changing. I think one of the tendencies is not enough novelty is being used. And this paper really emphasized the importance of novelty. And that would be something I've, uh, th that when they build the new um, equine center at, um, at CSU, it'd be really great to do some research on this using the horses, taking the same principle. And maybe it'll make the equine therapy work even better. Because there's a tendency sometimes in some programs, well, the kid wants to come in and just swing on this one piece of equipment and just do that the whole session. No, they would say, no, you, you gotta do different things and stimulate different senses in different ways, always a pair of them at the same time, and one of the senses is always a primitive sense, which is gonna be vestibular, touch, or smell. Also, in kids that have horrible sensory problems, those often work better than seeing or hearing. See, I, you know, I grew up with dogs, and one of the things, I noticed a lot of things about dogs. I'm very interested in, also, on in how um, genetics and breeding affects personalities of animals. Uh, because you've got kind of two kinds of labrador. You've got that real heavy set lab that makes a great service dog for somebody in a wheelchair, and then you've got those frisky, skinny labs that want to run and chase the ball. Well, you see, that's genetic differences in their behavior. And I've always been really interested in that, and I've read a whole lot about that. And you don't want to overselect for these traits, because I talked to a blind lady about six months ago, and they, you know, they're really selecting the guide dogs to be like super calm. They're getting epilepsy. I'm not kidding, getting epilepsy. And in the book I have on uh, genetics and the behavior of domestic animals, there's this, I write about scientist Belief. And Belief, years ago, like 60 years ago, wanted to breed a fur fox that wouldn't rip your hand off. So he started selecting fur foxes to be really calm and gentle. And they ended up with a heavy set, black and white border collie fox. Okay, that was fine. But then they overdid it and they got epilepsy. Now you over select for behavior traits, you're gonna get some trouble. When you get these dogs that are too albino-like, you know, they're blind and they're deaf and all kinds of trouble with them. Getting diagnosed as an adult, now, where getting diagnosed as an adult can be helpful is, is when there's relationships are a problem. And that's why I did this other book, Different Not Less. It was 14 old Asperger's that got diagnosed later in life because they had relationship issues. And that's where a diagnosis was helpful. You know, where I'm actually seeing the diagnosis being less helpful is sort of getting it babied and held back on the job front. And then I'm always asked about learning how to drive. I'll tell you, I learned how to drive on my aunt's ranch dirt roads. It's three miles up to the mailbox, three miles back every day on a really horrible clutch truck. So I had, I added up, I had 200 miles of driving in a totally safe place before we did traffic. So what I'd recommend on the driving is find um, big parking lots, big dry open fields, uh, back dirt roads and burn up a tank of gas and learn how to drive the car and then do the driver's ed. It's going to take longer to learn how to l drive the car and you've got to get the steering, braking, and the gas onto autopilot in your brain. And that will solve the multitasking problem. Now that's what you need to do. And in San Francisco, I understand there's an abandoned military base that's absolutely fantastic and it's got stop signs and houses and everything and no traffic. That would be a great point. Well, one of the questions was what are the goals with the uh, Temple Grand and Riding Center? One of the big things is research to validate uh, that therapeutic riding works. And our occupational therapist, uh, the uh, therapy department, will be very much involved in this. They've already looked through tons and tons of literature and found that, yeah, there's some studies out there that are starting to validate it. But we need to be doing more studies. One thing I'd be interested in working on is is taking some of those ideas from this environmental enrichment is an effective treatment from autism paper and, and applying it to therapeutic writing. Like I noticed today, they were doing things with some rings, but maybe they could do some other things with uh, uh, stimulate hearing, stimulate um, things they touch, maybe different materials on the handle on the saddle that they grip. You see, it's, it's, it's always, it's always changing it. And this also helps to desensitize the nervous system so they won't have so many problems with sound sensitivity. For me, sound sensitivity is just a nuisance. 
I, it, it, you know, the, and the scratchy clothes thing, I just have to find things that are not itchy. And I find some t-shirts itch and some don't. And the ones that itch, I don't uh, wear those. Another thing is if it goes against my skin, it gets washed first. Faith, a part of my life? Well, I look up at the sky, and that really makes me think about a lot of things. And I did have a chance to visit NASA, and I got this Hubble Space Telescope deep space field with 100 galaxies in it. And I've got that in the wall of my bedroom. And I look at that. And just thinking about things. And I was down in that uh, cave after the freight elevator took me down into this uh, tunnel in the Fermi Lab, walking around on some metal catwalks in front of all these weird computer things. And, and I was holding on a metal handrail, just like one we'd have on a cattle facility. I'm holding this metal handrail, and I'm thinking, is this really solid? I can feel this metal handrail, but the neutrinos go right through it. Maybe it's not really solid. There's a lot of things I can't totally understand. There's some good books. Um, uh, Cy Montgomery wrote a book about me that you know describes my experiences. Uh, there's quite a few good books for children out there. You know, if he's a fully verbal kid, tell him Einstein had it. Don't let it don't let it hold you back. Einstein had Einstein had no language until age three, and. What I shudder about what might happen to him in today's school systems. How many drugs they'd have him loaded up on and things like that. Now, you know, it, it's a, there's a lot of good stuff he can read, but don't let it hold him back. The thing I don't think's good is when 10 year olds walk up to me and all they want to do is tell me about their autism. I'd rather have them tell me about their science project or they went riding or something, or they came over here and went riding. I, it, it's, um, they're getting totally hung up on autism. Oh, I'm sure the math department, the computer science department's got a whole bunch of them. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're the ones, see the techies avoid the labels. They all send their kids to Montessori schools and apprentice them into the field. But then uh, they're finding out that uh, you put two techies together, then you get nonverbal autistic kids sometimes. You concentrate that genetics. And that's not so funny. But they, they, um, they're all over the place. You see, and part of the problem is some of the people that are off in tech land, they want to avoid the labels. I've made a point of trying to go across the silos. That's why I'm deliberately, you know, one night I'm in Fermi Lab, then I come here and I've got autism events tomorrow. I like jumping between the silos because I think there's knowledge I can bring in that you know, a lot of people don't realize, you know, they get the kid labeled autism. I just ask the parent, how old, how can he talk, what can he do? I don't really care what his label is. Okay, he's socially terrible, and we have to do something about that. It, it's, I'm, I'm also finding, I worked 20 years in the construction industry, where I would sell a job, a design job, I'd do the drawings and design it, then supervise this construction, finish the job, we gotta finish the job, start it up and make it work. And I'm finding that affects my whole way I think. I see a 13-year-old walk up to me that's really, really smart, or an 18-year-old walk up to me that's uh, never gone shopping. I've got problems with that. Because I want to see them go out and get a good job. When I worked on construction, I worked with some of the greatest guys in skilled trades that were on the spectrum. And Fermi Lab's full of them. Silicon Valley's full of them. They're everywhere. <laughs> you see, it's a continuum. When does geeks and nerds become autism? I went to college with geeks and nerds that would be definitely labeled on the spectrum today. You see, being a visual thinker, I get away from the words. See, when I talk about it, I see these people. I see them. You see, it's not verbal. You see, when you think in verbal, you tend to overgeneralize. And I find people are really bad about this on troubleshooting. And I don't care if it's troubleshooting a problem with an autistic kid or troubleshooting a problem with a horse behavior or dog behavior. There's gross overgeneralization. People say, what do I do about autistic behaviors in the classroom? Well, I don't have any idea what I'm going to do because I'm going to have to ask a lot more questions. How old? How much speech have I got? What is he doing in the classroom? I couldn't even begin to answer that. The only question on autism I can answer general, in generality is that if he's three years old and not talking, I can give you a canned answer for that. And then once we get past that point, I have to ask a lot more questions. And the same thing with horse behavior questions. It's the same thing. 
have to ask a lot more questions. Communication devices, well, you got somebody that's nonverbal, you got to give them a way to communicate. And now some can learn the type. There's some good books you can pick up. One of them is um, uh, Tito Muckapatahe, How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move? Uh, and he types completely independently and he looks super low functioning. And there's also Carly's Voice and The Reason I Jump. You see, and these kids are living in a totally <coughs> sensory disordered world. But some can learn the type. And I'll tell you a little secret about the typing. Attention shifting slowness. <coughs> so if you have a regular desktop or a laptop, if you look down at the keyboard, type it, you got to look up. That doesn't work. That does not work. You have to use something like a tablet where the print appears right next to the, <coughs> the print appears right next to the keyboard because they can't make the attention shift. Look at the, even on a laptop, you see, you still have to look up. The, the uh, type appears too far away from the keyboard. <coughs> well, yeah, I'd worked on kosher slaughter. You see, in this country, in kosher slaughter, some plants were hanging cattle upside down by the ankle. Yes, and I did work on devices to hold cattle in a much nicer way. And if you're interested in reading about that stuff, you can look it up on Grandon.com. Just my last name, Grandon.com. TempleGrandon.com is an autism site. Grandon.com is, uh, it, it go, I go into all the slaughter stuff. <laughs> on stimming, I think the thing to do on stimming, some kids have to do it more to calm down. I, I was allowed to have some time to do stimming, but there were places that were not allowed, like the dinner table. Uh, some are going to need you know, time out to do that. <coughs> it's going to vary. And there's some kids where you can just get rid of it. You see, this is where, where it's a continuum. But you take the kids that are very more severe, very, very bad sensory problems, they have to do some of that to calm down. But the problem is if you let a little kid stim all day, he shuts the world out and won't develop. You see, it's sort of a balancing act. I was allowed to do some stimming after lunch in my room and spin this little brass plate, but other times it was not allowed. And then as I got a little older, by the time I got third and fourth grade, I didn't stim in my room anymore. I made things. Well, yeah, there's, a, there's some neurotypicals that uh, will twist their hair, yes. And a little bit of that, it's, a, it's kind of a continuum, is some of that same thing. Now, you take people that have ticks. I know people that I work with professionally that have ticks and they were forced to stop doing the ticks. So what they did is they, they went to ticks that didn't bother anybody, like rapid blinking, twitching their, their mouth. That's one of the best ways to deal with Tourette's. Okay, let's just make the tick into something that's not obnoxious. Verbal ticks are just horrible. So you've got to get rid of those. You know, it, it's, uh, you see, they're living in a, some of these more severe ones. They live in a disordered world. Okay, you've all know what it's like when the TV pixelates you know, the image on the TV breaks up. Imagine your visual system's doing that, especially when you get tired or there's too much rapid movement. You notice that TV pixelates lots of times when there's a lot of rapid movement on it. Well, people on the severe end of the spectrum, their visual system's doing that. The circuits here in the back of the head that assemble the graphics file are all screwed up. And that's why they do it. Hearing's cutting in and out like a bad mobile phone. You all know what that's like. That's real miserable. And so they're smelling and tapping and touching everything. Smell and touch actually still work. Some of these severe ones, vision, vision's a total mess. And then they'll learn better through their ears. Want to make friends that struggle what age? Six, seven? Well, I think the best thing is through shared activities. I think one of the bad things we got today is kids are spending way too much time on the screens. I think we need to have times we get rid of the screens you know, part of the time. I learned how to take turns on the Parcheesi board. See, back in the 50s, did a lot of board games. But even the normal kids need to get off the screens. I talked to a lady that had ran a camp on her farm for 8 to 11-year-old normal kids, and there's no screens. And so when it was time for free play, these boys didn't know what to do in the walnut orchard. It took two days of video game withdrawal before they discovered free play. But when they discovered it, they found out that they really liked it. And, and I think we got to work on getting activities where there's a shared interest, like doing something with Legos. or I think it's really bad that so much hands-on stuff's taken out. Like, how can a kid find out he likes music if he never gets to try an instrument? Or find out he likes theater if, he's, if there's no school play? 
capacity, a lot of those activities they've taken out could turn into jobs. Skilled trades, I'm going to guess on the high end of the spectrum, maybe 20, 25 percent of them, skilled trades is where they need to go. And we have a huge shortage right now in skilled trades. Huge shortage. Ton of good jobs. Do animals get autism? There are some situations where you have an animal put in a very, very uh, deprived, sensory deprived environment and you will start to get some of this repetitive behavior that resembles um, kids with autism. My earliest memories, I can remember some things back when I went to speech therapy class. I can remember uh, uh, the teacher pushing me and having, she was holding up a cup and she'd say, say cup, and then she'd say cup. Huh. And she slow down. She slow down and enunciate the hard consonants. You got to slow down working with these kids because if you say it too fast, all the hard consonants drop right out and they do not hear the hard consonants. I, so I can remember um, I was taught never to point anything sharp at somebody, and the and the speech teacher would use the blackboard pointer to point to different students. I was afraid of that, and I couldn't tell her. I remember a lot more things like around five. I was very frustrated at school when they didn't give me time to respond. You got to give these kids time to respond. The wheels turn slowly. So we had a little assignment where it had pictures of things like a suitcase and a bicycle and, and you had to mark down all the ones that began with B as in beautiful and I marked the suitcase down as B as in bag. In our house they were called bags. And I was so frustrated the teacher just marked that wrong. and didn't give me time to explain that in our house it was a bag. And that was just the most frustrating thing because I did understand it. You see, you've got to give these kids time to respond. You've got to, when you're trying to get them to talk, I have moms that bring their kids in and the little kid's hugging mom and, and mom wants to do all the talking for the kid. And I've managed to give the kid a wireless mic and get him to talk, but I've got to hold the audience back. They want to clap. Uh, I got to give that kid to respond. And I might have to hold him back 15 seconds. That's a long time, count to 15. Give that kid a chance to respond, and then he'll talk to the whole audience. But if they clap too quick, they scare them off. You got to give them time to respond. The wheels turn slowly. Well, you have people that are just discovering. You'll, usually, in the people that are just discovering, their job has usually gone pretty well. It might be an engineer or, or an artist, and their job's usually. Uh, you've got kind of two kinds. You have kind of where the job is going just fine and the relationships are a mess. And that's where the diagnosis gives insight because the spouse has to learn that you can't be subtle. If there's something he's doing you don't like, you got to just come out and tell him. You cannot be subtle. And then you have the guy that, um, you know, has lost a lot of jobs and things like that and doesn't realize he's, he's making people mad because he doesn't pick up the subtle social signs. You've got to be taught that. And that's brought up in my books, Different Not Less, than also the unwritten social rules. I would all, yes, you want to get me engaged. The other thing is you want a slow transition from the world of school to the world of work. I had a lot of work experience before I ever graduated from college. When I was getting my master's degree, I was painting signs for that Arizona State Fair Carnival. And they're really stupid signs for stupid exhibits. But that was learning important work skills. Now, you see, he should have done something to figure out what he was going to do before he actually retired. So it wouldn't be such a sudden change. You know, and Project Search, which has been very, very helpful in getting people with autism good jobs, there's a whole year they spend transitioning from uh, into the job. You don't know any more details about it. Well, so he left the job, he doesn't have anything to do. See, his job was kind of his life. See, for a lot of these guys, where they get into a decent career, their job is their life. They get out, they don't know what to do. Well, yeah, he's, he's got to get out of the house. He don't, shouldn't just be sitting around the house watching TV or playing video games. If he did a job in design, maybe he ought to start an after-school group um, teaching kids design, whatever. Yeah, he's saying I, you know, maybe he could teach his, his skill to kids, and then if there's some electronic stuff that he doesn't know, the kids can teach him the electronics, but then he can teach the kids the art and make it a great after-school activity to get other people into his career. I, I'm kind of finding, you know, where I'm at now, I'm making a point where I, I make a lot of speaking engagements and I want to talk to students because I want to get the next generation turned on. Like in cattle stuff, 
the next generation's coming around, and I had a great time talking with a young lady that's half my age. I've had my job longer than she's been alive. And getting out in the cattle industry with her, get showing her stuff and things. And I said, we were talking about street cred. And um, I said, yes, I've done plenty of the dirty stuff. And, and getting the young person turned on. You know, that's something that, that I'd like to see happen. That's what I'd recommend to this guy that's an artist of some kind that's retired from maybe industrial design job or something. Teach high school kids industrial design. What I'm learning, what I one thing I learned at Fermilab was the amount of people at Fermilab that got interested in physics and mechanical engineering because they were exposed to it in high school. She gets back to that exposure thing. Too many young kids today aren't getting exposed to enough cool stuff. Where autism come from, a lot of it's genetics. A lot of it's genetics. But the thing is, person with autism, they always keep learning. And the more they keep learning, the better they get. And one of the things that helps a lot of the milder autistics in my generation is social skills were just pounded in in the 50s. You were taught manners. You were taught this. It was all taught in a much more rigid way. You see, and that, you got to teach them. And you got to use the teachable moments. The way the 50s parenting worked, if I picked up the mashed potatoes with my finger, mother didn't scream no, she'd say, use the fork. And there were limits. TV was limited to one hour a day. I, but you use the teachable moments. I see too many parents scream today. Like I was getting on a plane recently, and this little boy ran in front of me, and the mom was screaming no. She should have said, wait for this other person to get on the plane, wait your turn. In other words, give the instruction rather than screaming. Use those teachable moments. It's what turns people on is let's look what somebody can do. I had a very good time with a guy in a wheelchair. He had real bad epilepsy, and they had, a, and they had, and they had some brain surgery so they could cut back the meds so he wasn't just a drug zombie. So now this guy wasn't a drug zombie anymore. Turned out he was a gorgeous photographer. And he had his photography on his phone, and he showed it to me, beautiful photography of flowers. And I'm going, wait a minute, this is professional grade. He's now teaching photography. Yes, he's in a wheelchair. He is, uh, he, and I said, you need to be uh, filming at flower shows in a wheelchair accessible convention center where you can go. Now, obviously, I'm, you know, there's some things he's not going to be able to do, but he's beautiful photography. I think lots of times people didn't want to talk to me when I first started out. Then I'd whip out one of my drawings, and they'd go, you did that? You see, then that's showing what you can do. Okay, so he can't straighten his arm out. But what can what what's this good what's this kid good at doing? He can ride horses really good, and he can probably ride horses better than somebody else could. So maybe he needs to put a video on on something that he can show that how well he rides horses. That's showing what you can do. Also, some kids are just curious about things like straightening the arm. You know that uh, this is some of that's just some of that's innocent. Well, that's, you want to work little kids. The research is pretty clear. You want to work on, you have little kids that are not talking, two and a half years old, you need to start doing something on it. Earlier you work on them, the better. That's the basic principle. You know, around age seven, uh, the speech circuits start to get overwritten and used for something else if they're not developed. But there's some kids that are echolalic that repeat back movie scripts, but they have absolutely no idea what the movie script means. And they can learn even as an adult, if, they have, if they're doing smooth echolalic, where the speech is coming out, they can do the whole, uh, you know, uh, Mer Little Mermaid or whatever movie or whatever, yak the whole thing out, frozen, yak out the whole script. The speech circuits are working. So all you gotta do is get the, <coughs> get the meaning hooked up. That can be done at an older age. Now, if there's no speech at all, you know, seven or eight years old. But some of those ones that look real low functioning, there's a few of them can learn to type. Okay, I think um, we're gonna end on that and thank you all for coming. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Grandin. Thank you so very much. What a gift to have you here tonight and what a gift to have all of you here tonight. Thank you.
Drive safely. If you want more information about what we do, www.sheacenter.org. Enjoy your evening, and thank you so very much.